Welcome back, everyone. We're so glad you're here again for another episode of the Field of Flourish podcast. It's always great to have you, and we've just been so happy to see our audience growing and people engaging and this content um, being meaningful for your life and for your journey. So today, we are going to talk about outgrowing our childhood, and not in the sense where we toss our old clothes out because we don't fit them anymore, but in the emotional outgrowing of learning how to not um, healing and repairing the parts of our childhood that are still affecting us today. And so often we think, you know, what happened then, happened then, what's happening now, is happening now. Um, but so much of the research in neuroscience and interpersonal neurobiology and just how humans work is showing that's not the case. So we're going to explore that today with you. And we want to tell you, so you can be thinking about this as you're hearing and maybe drawing some connection points, that we have a new group that we're offering, a new Regulate and Recover, which is our online support group. So this online support group, Regulate Recover, Trauma Healing for Those with Unhealthy Childhoods. And why we have created this group is we have found in our work personally with even friends and then our clients Many, many, many of us are uh, impacted by those early years who are still impacted now and are stuck now. And if we can understand uh, the past and our attachment styles and how we are regulated because we didn't get the co-regulation we needed, if we can put these puzzle pieces together, we can live more of the life that we want now. So that's what this episode is about. And we're excited to jump into this conversation. We are excited. I, I love listening to you. You're so smart. <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> and you need a minute to let your nervous system calm down a little bit because what was part of your morning, Mr. Um, well, I was uh, dealing with a very large spider in my office this morning. I don't like spiders mm. and very large ones. I like even less. Right. So true. I yes, I had to deal with that. It was not fun. <laughs> yeah. I he came in after finally getting outside and I was like, look at you overcoming your arachnophobia. You're so amazing. And instantly <laughs> It's like, there is no overcoming of my arachnophobia happening here. I faced it, but there was not much overcoming. I guess to a degree, because you did face it. Right. But yes. I told him he should get someone from our building to just come and get it, because the spider was like, how big was it? I mean, it was like with legs, it was easily that big. And it's the hairy one. What's it called? Wolf? Wolf I, I don't know. Wolf spider, spider is what some people have said. I don't know if that's, I'm not a spider specialist, but it was big. Yeah, it was intense. And then when you finally brought it outside, what did you see outside? <laughs> so yeah. You set it, set it well, down. It was up inside of our dehumidifier. Our dehumidifier. So I had to take the small dehumidifier outside and I was going to put it over there in the grass. And then there was a big snake in the grass. <laughs> Not a big one, but pretty long and decent size one. And I was like, oh my goodness. It was, yeah. it was a rough, rough little bit. It was. And and you came in and you were like, my nervous system needs a break. Because yeah. all of these perceived and real threats kind of add up. Yeah. Especially when they're creepy. Things that I don't like dealing with and are yeah. surprising me. <clears throat> yeah. And the modern person in an industrialized country doesn't really have to deal with these things often. They get, they get someone, they get, I don't know what, what they do. Um, well, if it's, I mean, but, we would have just ignored it if it wasn't in our office. Like we had one in the, right. Our bathroom here last week. Right. Right. If it just stays outside or is in a public place, it's not a problem, but not our office. No, we Anyways. Office sneaking up on us. No, we really don't. Like it did. So what should we talk morning. about? Like it did this about? morning in my during my one of my sessions. <laughs> oh right, yeah. 
Not but the best. yes, what are we going to talk about today? I, I'm excited about this conversation. We've talked on it, obviously, and uh, mm -hmm. going back to the even first couple episodes talking about attachment um, and insecure attachments. Uh, talk are we're going to re re revisit some of those those topics. Um, but we're just going to also bring in a, an additional topic of like regulation and neuroception and how that attachment in that beginning years kind of lays the foundation for a for struggles relationally, interpersonally, um, with nervous system regulation and um, different ways that affects us and how it presents so mm -hmm. it's it's i think very applicable topic for a lot of people yeah um so what are some of the things that people would say or feel not like struggle wise not necessarily recognizing that this is totally connected to their their childhood development um, what would be some of those yeah um, yeah, I mean, it could be, um, I'm not okay if everybody else isn't okay. Well, I need people to be okay for me to feel okay. Um, I, I'm overwhelmed a lot. Um, I get angry quickly. I, I lash out when I don't want to. Um, I go from zero to 60 quickly. I, I don't understand why. Or... Um, I feel anxious or tense and I don't understand there's like I'm I feel safe everything is safe but my body is not responding that way mm -hmm. and so this those are just a couple ideas of uh, what I've heard being said maybe felt um, mm -hmm. some ideas you have any you yeah. would want to add to that yeah I think that's a good picture of what it feels like what it can feel like from the day to day um and not having the language to understand, oh, this is my nervous system being activated, or oh, this is my nervous system being shut down. And mm -hmm. this constant roller coaster I feel like I'm on is dysregulation. Yeah. Uh, without that language, uh, we're, we essentially feel powerless to those sensations and realities. And the more powerless we feel, the more unsafe our nervous system feels. And that cycle is just a vicious, vicious cycle. And it usually starts way, 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 way back. Mm -hmm. um so yeah I guess maybe I'd add like why is it so hard for me to get close to someone mm -hmm. why when I'm close do I feel threat yeah. um why when someone pulls away or is mad at me do I feel so uncomfortable and unsafe and anxious until there can be that uh, repair why do I avoid intimate relationships why do i just stay surface level with people mm -hmm. why is it so painful for me to actually explain how i am for, to actually tell people what's going on in my inner world why do i feel such perfectionistic tendencies uh, why is everything on me why do i feel like all the pressure is on me to make everything work to help everyone to fix everything i mean it really is quite expansive what it's, this can be like what yeah. the effects unhealthy childhoods can can look like in different people's lives yeah you, you're absolutely right it is expansive and looks can look very similar in some ways and very different in other ways and yeah. so um so like maybe we should just jump in and talk a little bit more about what it might look like uh at the beginning um and how the beginning kind of affects at the importance of the, the beginning like going back to attachment mm -hmm. um yeah. because a lot of things that we're talking about it's also the inability to self-regulate right and so and it, we could we can be so frustrated with ourselves like why can't i just self-regulate why can't i just overcome these fears why does everything seem so like everything's uphill everything's hard everything seems scary um challenge in this can i just hold it together and what that's describing as self-regulation and the good news 
and the hard news because like one it's not your fault like self-regulation isn't something you just white knuckle your way through yeah to learn self-regulation is is intended to be a skill that is taught at a young age um, by your parents co-regulating you mm -hmm. And so if the parents hasn't co-regulated you well, one, you have, you, along, with, along with some other dynamics, you build a, an insecure attachment mm -hmm. and you don't learn how to self-regulate. So when a, when a baby need, has needs or is dysregulated, is upset, crying, tired, um, ideally, the caregiver comes alongside them and calms them, attunes to them, engages with them. And over years and years of this happening, that co-regulation and that nervous system of the caregiver is co-regulating the nervous system of that baby and that child. And as a child grows up and starts maybe going to school, going to friends, starts having that separation, that normal, healthy separation, Mm -hmm. The nervous system doesn't feel the jolt and the the shock of, oh no, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I can't, um, what if something bad happens? I need my, I need somebody to help me. The nervous system says, we know how to do this. We've been shown how to do it. We remember how to do it. So if something hard happens, this is what we, this is what our body needs to do. Mm -hmm. But if it's not there, if that co-regulation hasn't been there consistently, then there isn't that wiring. There isn't those tool, those internal tools that says, we know how to do this. Mm -hmm. It says, things are out of control. We need to fight, fight somebody. We need to run away. We need to, we need to shut down. Because those are the ways that they, your body has learned that if you you were crying and no one was there, it says crying is not going to help. So shut down so you don't have to feel this, or cry harder until somebody hears you. And maybe after ten minutes of crying, somebody came. It's like okay, so you you need to fight harder. So that's the wiring your body remembers, or yeah. um, you need to run away to get away from it, or you need to run away and attune and pursue to get that need met. And so when you have that separation, that's what your body does. Something hard happens like, well, you don't, don't fight it because that's never helped. Mm -hmm. uh, don't run because that's not going to help. So just, we just need to disassociate. And so that could be, and then we start bringing on these adaptations. Um, we, maybe early on, it's, Maybe it's perfectionism, uh, maybe mm -hmm. some OCD tendencies, um, maybe people pleasing, maybe yeah. getting good grades, um, being a funny one, being a class clown. Um, uh, so that's like a fawning response. Class clown is that fawn response. Um, maybe you have to be a bully. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think of that one. Um, and on the other end, being super compliant, mm -hmm. which should be fawning as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and so it may be flight. I mean, maybe it, it, that'd be more of an avoidance, avoiding school, avoiding uh, maybe friend's house challenges, trying to make not just feeling like learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. and so that's early on then it turns into some of the same patterns but there's also addictions like addictions are adaptations of uh, to self-regulate I mm -hmm. someone else is going to help me self-regulate I don't know how to self-regulate so here are the tools that are going to co-regulate me a person's not a relationship's not behaviors addictions um those types of things are going to self-regulate and then when I was we... to, I'm sorry, Go ahead. just wanted to share this quote. I was listening to a book with um, Tessa today 
our 13 year old. And there was a quote that just literally jumped, um, not off the pages, because it was an audio book. So we need to change that phrase, jumped out of the microphone. <laughs> um, how easy it is to love something that distracts you from your pain. Hmm. Wow. And yeah. she noticed it to be really powerful and to hold so much truth. Like if there's pain, the way you find to not feel that pain is what you begin to love. Yeah. And it doesn't mean love in the sense of affection, but love is in this is rescuing me from a reality that I cannot bear, that I am not equipped to be in, from a grief that I don't know how to mm -hmm. navigate. Yeah. And so we begin, even as teens, to, to love these adaptations, in a sense, love, um, because they are what is helping us survive yeah and yeah. we can honor that even though they cause harm like it's not denying the harm that they've caused to us or to our relationships or to our futures to opportunities we've missed to people we've hurt but it's looking at wow what a what a powerful thing my my body and mind did to find this adaptation mm -hmm. to help me survive in a world that felt way too painful to yeah. exist in yeah, I like that. That's a really good quote. And like, there's a love, but there's, it's like an appreciation, a, a gratefulness yeah. of, because it is, a lot of times it is literally the desire for survival or the feeling like I need to survive and I need this to help me survive. Because the mm -hmm. alternative is sitting in this pain that I can't soothe. Yeah. Or this fear that I can't, soothe and regulate um and and then you can see how that can cause problems in relationships like if i love and appreciate and need these things mm -hmm. and these adaptations then that means i'm not going to get them from relationships so if i'm in a relationship how how much uh angst is that going to create in that relationship because relationship doesn't feel like the safe thing right relationship isn't the thing that i can trust to co-regulate me or bring on yeah. help me self-regulate it's these other things and mm -hmm. as we know a lot of adaptations either are contrary to relationship or mm -hmm. um, harm relationship or in some way intersect and divide relationship, um, yeah. even if it's ple people pleasing. Um, yeah, it can be. I have I, I, like people pleasing slash like workaholic. Um, I have to find my soothing and and my people pleasing, or in the, in the mm -hmm. affirmation and approval of these people, and that takes away from maybe the people you're in relationship with, the closer relationships. Um, uh, drugs, alcohol, pornography. Um, that's going to, if if the relationship is what's triggering me and what's scaring me and what's dysregulating me, and I'm right. going over here to find regulation, not only is it going to drive a wedge between you and your, that, that relationship, uh, but it may even destroy that relationship, but also isolate you. Um, yeah. And as we bury more and more pain, because within relationship, there is pain. Mm -hmm. Relationships are hard. So not only is that reaffirming that relationship is bad, but it's also there's more and more pain that we're covering, mm. which is more and more evidence why we need to isolate. We need to not trust um yep. and <clears throat> there's so many more adaptations um that makes me think of what a double whammy um unhealthy childhoods are in that, that sense of you are conditioned to feel unsafe in things that are actually life-giving that will right. actually lead to healing restoration connection 
and at the same time conditioned to be drawn towards things that are actually unsafe for you um, as, as the answer. So it's like, it's not only are you not getting the good that you're intended as a human to get, you're, you're pursuing and reenacting these uh, trauma behaviors and this vicious cycle of um, I'm not good enough, shame, like you just get buried and buried and buried and buried until you are, like you said, completely isolated and have burned bridges that mm -hmm. could have been what, what brought restoration and healing. Yeah. So it's just, it's so like, this is so close to our hearts because we, we see, um, you know, we work with these beautiful, worthy people that because of how those early years of their journey went, they have been so conditioned for um, to pursue harm and to run from good, essentially, mm -hmm. if you boil right. it down really simply. Yeah. And that cycle just perpetuates throughout their life and causes so much heartache and suffering. Yeah, and in unhealthy childhoods, we're not talking about big T, even big T traumas. Yes, that's there. Mm -hmm. But just even little T traumas of... Um, having a hypercritical parent, um, having an emotionally disconnected parent, um, uh, being triangulated between parents, um, yeah. uh, per performance-based expectations, um, all having of these, no voice. Having, having no voice, no yep. autonomy, having to comply, um, you think of the big six that Adam Young talks about those, yep. We, and we talk about them a lot in our program and also on the podcast and in our content is those big six are the, the, the childhood needs for you to develop in a healthy environment and not experience trauma. And mm -hmm. these aren't things like, oh, there needs to not be crime or war or drugs. Like right. those it's, are what are considered big T and they're there. And a lot of us have experienced them, but also there's a whole other world of things that cause trauma in yeah. the the developing brain and that body. and those six things are just attunement responsiveness engagement allowing you to have hard emotions regulating themselves and when they mess up apologizing like yeah those are not abusive but they're like when those aren't happening that's neglectful and it is causing trauma because um, mm -hmm. when and you said you did air quotes but people didn't see that when you say not abusive, you're you're, oh. you're meaning the typical definition of what right. we hear of with a slap, a hit. I'm not feeding you tonight. I'm locking you in your room. That type of abuse, mm -hmm. right? But it's they're nonetheless abusive, and the research has shown they cause the they same cause harm and mm -hmm. same physiological responses and um, stored trauma, stored pain when they're not dealt with. Um, the other thing that I think it's Adam Young that says, or he quotes somebody um, that like trauma happens when somebody, when something unsafe happens and somebody that's who's supposed to be safe and create safety doesn't create safety. Yeah. Like, like that's where trauma um, happens. And so, and then it's never found safety. So it's not like we missed it and then we come back or we made right. a mistake and then we apologize. Like that resolves that experience but that's never found resolution yeah and those things get stored and create narratives and create feelings and then lots of those built onto each other creates wiring and creates paradigm like thoughts and schemas and worldviews mm -hmm. and, and we carry that with us yeah. um and it affects us and on a spectrum it affects us, but affects us. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something, I think. Yeah. Um, we're going to have another episode specifically about this, but I just would like to throw this in that um, when those, what Luke just described of multiple events that created unsafety and that were not repaired, where safety was not reestablished, the culmination of that effect often is a CPTSD diagnosis. 
And CPTSD is like PTSD in the symptoms. Um, it's, it's generally considered the causes are where it's a bit different. So you have large traumatic shock trauma with PTSD. So there's some type of event or events that are considered big. So an assault or you're in a natural disaster or a war or um, some, some event used your house gets broken into something like that, PTSD develops and then all the symptoms from that. So that, that was more classically understood probably in like the seventies, would you say they started maybe eighties started to yeah. put some words to that. Um, and more recently CPTSD, I don't know when that word came about, but it was realized, oh, wow, people who haven't actually gone through those shock traumas, which they're considered, um, have similar symptoms. And it, and it was kind of like a, a mystery for a while until they realized, oh, this is just another, another category of, um, of trauma affecting yeah. the body, another form of PTSD. So it's considered complex PTSD, C PTSD. And um, the symptoms look very similar. It's pervasive, it's chronic, it is um, affects life and functionality. But what has caused it is, like Luke was just explaining, the smaller, quote, smaller um, absences of safety and lack of repair over and over and over yeah. that go on to create a body that has CPTSD. Correct. Yes. So that's a helpful thing if, if you haven't heard or maybe just to consider that um, yeah. possibility. Yeah, and that is a great point, and that there's even uh, there is an understanding that it's not just somebody saying, "Oh, yeah, it was a hard childhood, and I feel like I it was a lot, but it wasn't a big deal." But like they're noticing that I mean, being in a stressful situation, family environment, over a long period of times without that finding safety actually mm -hmm. creates CPTSD. Um, yeah. and, and so this, these experiences affect our nervous system where we're supposed, where we are intended to find safety and regulation and that never comes. We, we learn, we adapt new ways to find a sense of safety or, um, peace or calmness, but really it's just a disassociation of of the pain it's not an actual dealing with it and going into that safe and social it's in and, and from those experiences um there's a, something called neuroception neuroception is that internal feeling and information that is going on in your body and the external uh information that's happening around you and when you you have experiences that says this experience is not safe or nobody's going to listen to you or no one really cares or no one's going to apologize. Your, your voice doesn't matter. We're going to take that information and our body's going to say, well, this situation is similar to that one back then. So it's the same. So no one cares about you now either, or you, your needs don't matter. Or the only way you're going to matter is if you, do A, B, C, and D. So that neur the neuroception gets off and we start pursuing relationships by denying ourselves, dis disembodying from our needs, uh, disembodying from our emotions and desires and, only and attuning to the relationships, the world around us in order to, con to control those aspects to find safety. So you can see that there is an adaptation, there's an intelligence in our body as we do these things. Because it doesn't know how to regulate in a um, healthy, efficient way of going into that safe and social nervous system state. 
so it adapts and says, well, we can't stay sympathetic and hypervigilant all the time. So let's try to control some things in order to find mm -hmm. acceptance. Mm -hmm. And so you, you do get that little bit of acceptance, but it, it's not found within yourself. It's found within other people. So we're giving yeah. power in a way where instead of realizing the power that we have to regulate ourselves and control our nervous system, we're giving it and have an agreement that that power can only or that um, regulation is only found in external things, whether it's drugs, pornography, sex, uh, work, a approval, accomplishments, um, relationships, relationships, uh, food, um, performance. And so that's, and that's, that could be a very um, powerless feeling because we're not realizing that we have power and we're giving yeah. it to other people. If it can feel very powerless and feel very stuck. Um, and some, a lot of times we don't even know we're, that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Because one, when trauma happens, we become disembodied. So we don't even know what we're feeling. It comes autonomic, our autonomic nervous system and it becomes automatic, jumps in there and just, we do because it's worked in the past. And so it takes even a question or a slowing down or a realization of, oh, I'm doing this. And that's kind of the purpose of this podcast of just bringing some language and some invitations and insight of like, oh, I do that. Mm -hmm. There's not shame and condemnation and judgment on that. It's like, of course you do. There's a reason why you do that. Yeah. But there's also the a time, way to cut, to bring that power back to, sorry, to take that power back and and learn how to self-regulate. Even if there wasn't co-regulation in the past, you're not hopeless. You can learn tools. It's just not from white knuckling it or external sources. Right, right. It's your own empowerment of of learning how much influence you have on your own body and. And learning that language of your nervous system of yep. when I'm scared, when I don't feel safe, I feel this and I go to this adaptation mm -hmm. and that meets this need. Is there another way to meet that need? So when this is out, the, our reel will already be out, but we just made a reel about control as an adaptation. And control is kind of one of those behaviors and characteristics that is really demonized in in our culture and it's kind of like well I could be like a perfectionist and like driven that that one's more okay but a controlling person you know we have this hierarchy for all of our adaptations and which Absolutely. ones are deemed more socially, socially appropriate, appropriate yeah. and which ones are like on the bottom but but if you look at them all through the lens of, of survival uh survival stress and how the human responds to that they're all quite similar mm -hmm. but the the real is about control and how if you don't know so control as a survival adaptation and if you don't know what your body is still stuck in trying to survive how are you ever going to understand your desire and your need to control and rewire it? You, yeah. you can't. If you don't understand awareness and uh, mindfulness is the, the, the first point of contact with change, the, the very beginning of how we, how we transform. And so in this reel, we're just inviting people to, to consider, to look at their need to control as an adaptation made long ago when they didn't get their needs met in a healthy, consistent manner. And if your needs weren't met um, from your attachment figures consistently and um, appropriately, you, your body uh, recognized, okay, well then I'm the one who needs to make this happen. Right. And that adaptation has driven you to maybe manipulate or control situations 
so that you can try to have some semblance of, of care and of your needs met. And so taking it out of that demonizing light and looking at it up, oh, wow, this was truly an adaptation. And maybe I don't need it anymore. Yeah. Maybe I can update the maps and I can learn that I can have needs and I can have those needs met and reciprocated mm -hmm. in healthy mm -hmm. relationships. Yep. And I don't have to do these adaptations any longer to be okay. Yep. I'm just even thinking about anger. Like anger is one of those socially inappropriate ways of yep. controlling people. One. Yeah. But what is anger? Anger is a protection. It's a fight response of saying, I'm not safe. You're not safe. Stay away from me. And I need to maybe be bigger and scarier to make sure you stay away from me so I, I feel safe. But a lot of times we don't want that anger. We don't like the anger. And so we, there's a lot of shame and self, self hatred, um, and embarrassment. But if you can understand like that, yes, that anger is there, but why is that anger there? What are you trying to protect? What do you, what do you need to understand? Um, what do you need to comfort that that little that little person inside of you that little child inside of you that didn't get that nurturing care and comfort and didn't see that um, somebody will will pursue them and care for them but that they had to fight for themselves and also maybe that's how you saw your parents respond Again, a lot of the nervous system is not taught, or was it not caught? Is taught? Oh, there it's, you go. Once not taught, it's caught. <laughs> there you go. That makes more sense. So your parents, so it's kind of like just like the co-regulation. If they can self-regulate and co-regulate you, then you can learn how that co-regulation is possible and that self-regulation is possible. If you don't get that, it's like correctly co-regulation is not possible. And self-regulation only happens by yelling at people or getting mm -hmm. angry or perfectionism. Yeah. And so that's like the, the, I don't know if it's the right language, but like the ex existential issue that we all have, like, I don't want to be like my parents. Oh, and yet <laughs> I am. There's a reason why that is. It's because your right. nervous system has been wired by their nervous system. So you experience, you've been shown and um modeled modeled how to handle stressful situations and unstressed and non-stressful situations your your default is going to be to handle them the same way that your parents did right and that is not a a sentencing of like okay well that's how i do it so i have to do it the rest of my life it, there's resources there's war, there's things that you can do to teach your nervous system to respond a different way for that autonomic nervous part of your nervous system to respond in a more empowering, intentional way um, in more of a way that you want to respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can update your neuroception. Mm -hmm. Again, neuroception is autonomic. Um, it happens in 0 0.05 seconds. You can, you can detect whether an environment is safe or not that is incredibly fast <laughs> and it, in that 0 0.05 seconds your body's already decided it if you you can feel safe if you should feel like you need a fight flight freeze fawn or shut down and but there's work that you can do and mindfulness and body work that can help rewire that mm -hmm. so you can update that this environment feels unsafe and this is why it feels unsafe but here's some information that it's actually not it actually is safe like um, one exa personal example my wife lauren is wonderful and she's passionate <laughs> and for a long time her passion scared me hmm. i saw passion as anger or her, her even intensity as anger, as 
as um, danger cues. Yeah. And so I would become protective, defensive, either shut down or try to fight um, or run away. <laughs> I've, I've tried them all <laughs> at different seasons. Mm -hmm. But I was able, I, I have been able to update that information that she's not angry. She's just passionate or she is, she's scared or she's being protective. And um, we're also still in proce process. So it's not like 100% of the time. I'm like, yep, I've got this <laughs> covered. I never get triggered ever, but there's still times so like, I can go back and like, oh, okay. I neurocepted that she's mad at me and doesn't want to be, it doesn't want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I can then take that to her and say, oh, this is where we missed. And we can update each other's neuroception and information and, and continue on a journey of, of working through that. Um, and so that's a, just a quick example of how we can update our neuroception, how our neuroception on a daily basis can read something and read something as this is truth, but actually not be 100% accurate. Like, right. it's not that you're angry at me and don't want to be in a relationship with me, with me and want to scare me and want to push me away. It's, oh, maybe you're hurt or you are upset, but that doesn't mean you don't want to engage. But my neuroception mm -hmm. saying, you need to run, you need to hide, you need to fight, um, you need to shut down. Anything you want to add with that, Hun? Yeah, that was a great personal example. Um, I was thinking something as you were talking about, oh, how, how it's automatic. So mm -hmm. it's called the autonomic nervous system because it's uh, automated. It is involuntary. Yeah. It's, um, it is, what's another adjective for, to describe that? It's happening without your conscious awareness, conscious awareness. So as we were planning for this conversation, I just was thinking, well, I just want to remind people, no wonder this work is so hard. You're trying to uh, jump into a system that's already the wheels and cocks are already turning. Think yeah. of like a factory. Everything's already going. <laughs> And you, your little person walks into the big old factory, industrial size building, and it's like, oh, I'd like to change this, please. <laughs> and, and the, the system's like, screw you. Like, what are you, who are you to change this? This has been in motion from the beginning of your existence, even prenatally. This is how we do it. Back up. And that's why so many of us succumb to this powerlessness because yeah. it is a huge massive effort to jump into how your nervous system operates and say we're gonna we're gonna operate this differently and i'm gonna help this navigate and direct this instead of it just happening yep and the other thing is like in a lot of cases it quote unquote works like people pleasing, perfectionism, being OCD, yeah. um, overeating, undereating, like anger, addictions, like like we said at the beginning, it doesn't it hurts relationships, but it keeps you alive. Like uh, we were watching a, a interfamily systems training, IFS training. They were talking about firefighters, and that's one of the protectors that helps us manage life they were saying like firefighters they don't care if you they ruin the picture on the wall they don't care if they hurt your furniture and ruin your furniture they just want to get the fire out and the people out of the house it is survival and so a lot of these adaptations are what we would call firefighters and so they're just looking to keep you alive they're not worried about keeping good intimate relationships and, and connection. When they're at play, they're just trying to say, keep you alive. So they're quote unquote working. They're keeping you alive. 
Yeah. And so there's also compassion there of like, of course you're doing these things. You may not like them. You may be trying to stop them, but of course you're doing them yeah. because they're keeping you alive. Yeah, that's why this, this work is so hard. Um, things have been in motion and it's hard to do this work because to try something new is scary. Like our brains are predictive organisms. So if this has worked, why are we changing it? And if I want, if, if I'm trying to change it, it's going to fight and say, no, like you're going to feel anxious. You're going to feel dysregulated. You're going to feel irritable because it's saying, don't change it. This is, this isn't going to end well. And that's why it's really important to not go in there white knuckling, fighting those, those feelings, or even saying that those sensations and feelings are bad and let's get rid of them. We need to pay attention to them. We need to listen to them and learn that language that our nervous system is speaking to us because mm -hmm. we may be misunderstanding it and misinterpreting it as, oh, my body's against me and I need to overpower it. It's like, no, we need to join our body and what it's saying and understand it. And, and that helps that analogy of that factory. When we jump into a factory and say, okay, new owner, we're changing everything. Everybody's like, no, this works. But if we can partner with it and say, hey, what's working, what's not working? Is this really getting to our objective? No, it's not really, but it works. Well, let's see if there's another way to get to our objective. And if objective, our objective is safety, well, okay, so you're getting angry at everybody and pushing them away. Does that make you feel safe? I mean, it stops people from hurting me and keeps people away. Well, I wonder mm -hmm. if there's another way to keep you safe. Let's look at it. Yeah. And that's really what, like, that's what we do here at Flourish Therapy. And that's what like this group is for, is help us, help you give tools mm -hmm. and resources and understanding and give you a place to start learning that language of, of your nervous system. Again, we've said this a few times, but like living in Thailand, learning Thai, a new language, there's a lot of misunderstandings. I say things I don't mean to say. I say things that I think is accurate. And then <laughs> a Thai friend looks at me with like a confused face. I'm like, that didn't make sense, did it? And they'll laugh with me and say, no, it didn't. <laughs> but <laughs> as there's some conversations. I've learned the language. I know how to communicate that, that message. And we get on the same page and we are able to achieve the goal of the conversation. So I think that's also a piece of what you were saying, Lauren, is a lot of times we come in trying to overtake the factory. And that's where we feel mm -hmm. some of that pushback because things are working. Yeah. And in a way, yes, they are working. They're keeping you alive, but there might be, there is a better way to get to the objective. We just have to find out what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good. It takes, and that takes time. Yeah. So I'm thinking about um, a statement we use a lot with clients and with ourselves of I am and the world is mm -hmm. and how it'd be fun to explore that with each other um, to help to help paint the picture better of how our regulation tells us the story. So we've talked about this before, I think uh, it's this concept of story follow state. And essentially what it means is our state, meaning our nervous system state, whether we're regulated or dysregulated um, and just quickly regulation is the safe and social state. And the two primary dysregulated states are sympathetic, that's fight and flight, fight or flight, and then shut down. So safe and social, sympathetic and shut down. And there is another state in there, protective state, uh, dysregulated state called freeze, and that's between sympathetic and shut down. That's a blended state. So that one also feels differently, but we focus on the three, the three main ones. So those states, narrate the story we're believing from moment to moment. 
-hmm. those states are are telling us what is true in that moment so i am and the world is is a really helpful way to see bring some more insight into the state you're in Mm -hmm. and connect it with the story you're feeling the thing you're feeling is true and um and it's so and so insightful when we do it uh when we do this practice together or with clients so um I'll just read through kind of some in, in safe and social, when you're in safe and social, I am, could be, I am capable, I am open, content, at ease, hopeful, and connected. And the world is safe, beautiful, full of opportunity, accessible, good. So that is, I am, and the world is. And then for sympathetic, so this is our fight, flight, freeze, fawn state. I might feel I am tense, worried, irritated, wired, pressured, threatened. Scared. Feel all that constriction. Scared. So then what is the world? The world is scary, cruel, dangerous, threatening, cutthroat, um, nasty. Against me. Unkind. Against me. That in shutdown, it could be, I am empty, despairing, numb, hopeless, alone, lost. Tired. Tired, weary. The world is not safe, irreparably broken, overwhelming, crushing, Hopeless. Hopeless. Pointless. So as you can see, story follows state um, is there are are how we feel and and how the world seems is completely a hundred percent connected. I think a good example is like with parenting. I may be stressed whether it's from work or just stressed because it's chaotic and it, my body is feeling that stress and so therefore I'm the story is the rest of the night is going to be stressful it's going to be chaotic they don't listen they're not going to listen uh, I need to save everybody and calm everything down and so I need to control 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 or it may be <clears throat> I'm stressed and I don't want to control, so I shut down and it's like nothing I do helps. Nothing I do is going to make a difference. They're not going to listen to anything. We've tried a hundred different things and they <laughs> nothing works. Yeah. Or they're still not listening, but it's like, but I feel safe. I feel um, regulated. And it's like, oh, yep, they're being difficult. Mm-hmm. That's that's kids, you know. Mm-hmm. That there's there's still progress. It's better than it was last week. Better than it was yesterday. It's a good night. We can get through it. And it's just like, the circumstance is completely the same, but the story that you're telling based off of your state is entirely yep. different. Yeah, and that information is really important because then we can start meeting the need of that state right and that's that like that language of our nervous system is oh i'm sympathetic i need to get regulated i need to maybe move out of the situation and so that my state can shift and i can see a different story and engage differently mm-hmm. but right understanding where your nervous system is and how you what story you're seeing and help you understand how to meet the need that is there. Yeah, it, totally. Like Adam Young says, this work is fraught. <laughs> it's hard. Sure it it's difficult. Um, but it's doable. And it's worth yeah. it. Yeah, totally. So worth, totally it. worth it. Um, as we begin to wrap up, I just wanted to give our listeners um, 
some, some symptoms, some realities of what it might look like. We talked about it in the beginning, but just kind of add to that list of what it could look like if you are still uh, suffering from the effects of an unhealthy childhood, if that's you today in the here and now. And some of those symptoms are um, anxiety, depression, hypervigilance, unable uh, to relax, to be in the moment, to enjoy the moment, um, constant dysregulation, either always in shutdown or always in sympathetic or vacillating between the two. Um, so if you're chronically dysregulated, that's a, that's a big sign. Um, a strong negativity bias. So seeing the world and seeing every situation as what is lurking around that corner? What's going to go wrong? What do I need to see the bad in? There might be 95% good in a situation, but you're going to see the 5% bad and it's going to be highlighted nice and bright yellow for you. Um, that's, a, that's a negativity bias. So uh, developing pain, chronic pain, chronic illness, um, unhealthy, um, if you know, physical symptoms of representative of an unhealthy body, those often come from imbalances in the nervous system that begin years and years back that slowly lead to the body breaking down because as Gabor Mate says in his incredible book, the body says no. The body eventually says no because your mouth can't say no. Your boundaries can't say no. Your actions can't say no. Your body is all that's left to say no. Um, faulty neuroception, like Luke was describing, thinking that safe things are dangerous and dangerous things are safe. Mm -hmm. That's really, really common and really understandable. Um, looking for threats to find safety. Constantly aware, that's the hypervigilance of what, what's out there and what's not, what's not good disembodiment and disconnection. So we talk our fifth pillar of healing, um, which we also explore in the group is disembodiment and how embodiment, embodiment is the pillar because of the reality of disembodiment, how these unhealthy childhoods to survive, we, we in a sense disconnect from our true self. And that's the way we survive. And um, living a disembodied life means everything is, is uh, in like black and white life is dim. Life doesn't feel the way it's intended to feel. So that's why we seek more pleasure, more um, fulfillment outside of the healthy norms of human interaction, because life, we feel so disembodied and disconnected. Um, are there anything else as I'm saying those, those things that I think come you, up to you covered a lot. This one is I hear a lot is like, <clears throat> like a fuzzy, um fuzzy experience of like almost like watching yourself like live a life um not feeling really in your body yeah um, depersonalization yeah um if it, that's a, a common experience that's yeah another sign um but there's yeah you have most major ones and yeah. We're not going to hit all of them. Yeah. We sure are. Um, I guess addictions, we've talked about that, but uh, mm -hmm. having addictions or compulsive behaviors that you can't get over yep. uh, is often a sign. Um, and really, I don't know if we talked a lot about window of tolerance, but this, this term was coined by Dan Siegel. And it's just so helpful to understand, um, you know, you see people that that are flourishing, <laughs> no pun intended, that are doing great, that have these rich, meaningful relationships that uh, feel capable, feel grounded, feel like they can say yes and no, you know, just that, that, you know, not just look Instagram good, because we know that that means very little, but up close and personal, you know, that they're actually doing really well. Most likely a person like that has a large window of tolerance. And if you're looking on the screen, you can see me putting my hands out with a big space between the window of tolerance is our physiological capacity as a person, our nervous system's capacity. And when you've had unhealthy childhoods, you have, when you've had an unhealthy childhood, you haven't developed a large, robust window of tolerance. It's usually, you know, um, any variation of, of little. And so as long as things are in the window of tolerance and everything's kind of perfect around you, you can be okay. But if anything is a bit challenging, off, stressful, overwhelming, difficult, controversial, challenging, I already said that, challenging, <laughs> 
you are out of your window of tolerance and you are pushed to the hyper arouse, which would be sympathetic or hypo arouse, which is shut down. And that's why so many of us spend so much time in those states because our window of tolerance is crap. And it takes everything being perfect to feel yeah. even semi-decent. And so- and that's how we adapt is to try to get yeah. us back into that window of tolerance. That's why we control yeah. things. That's why we um, numb, th numb these feelings because that's trying to get us back in the window of tolerance. Right, that, adapt that attempt at regulating and just trying to feel normal and good in some sense of um, just peace. Like humans are made to feel good. It's wired into us, but from those early formative years, we don't experience that. And those years set into motion the rest of our days, unless we, we circle back around and figure out, work through it. Yeah. Do that, that hard work, that inner work and that empowering work to, to become the navigator of your nervous system, to partner, to befriend your body and your story. Uh, it's so possible. We see it, we're doing it and it's just really meaningful work. So we mm -hmm. applaud you all. If you're listening to this podcast, we know you're doing the work. Um, and it's just such a honor to be, um, engaging with people that are making such a difference in their life and in the lives of those they love because they're willing to go to these hard places. Yeah. Well said, hon. And I think that's a good place to end. So all of you are listening. Thank you, healers. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming back listen to our episodes like Lauren said we would love seeing this podcast growing um we didn't know what was going to turn into when we started it just a place for us to talk and now we're just so enjoy it and thank you for listening and hopefully this was uh, this was a this is a very important topic and um hopefully you can take some insights out of this and and learn from it and help yourself and move yourself further along in your healing journey. So thank you for coming again, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode. Mm -hmm.